Hi, I'm the Rap Critic, and this was a request by Royce A. Murray. And if you'd like to join my Discord, see episodes early, make requests for reviews, or vote on an episode, check out my Patreon, where you can help keep the show going, plus see what I'm up to in between episodes. As well, uh, during a time like this, when everyone's affected by what's happening in the world due to the shutdown, uh, more than ever, it's important for us to connect through social media and stuff like that. So if you'd like to keep up with what I'm doing in between episodes, definitely follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, all the links are in the link tree below. So let's talk about celebrities getting together to sing songs to us while they live far away from the consequences and in no way actually contribute to the solution. Cue the topical reference clip! Imagine there is no heaven. Seriously, let's get this out of the way now. Most charity songs, or whatever the hell Gal Gadot was trying to accomplish, are, are mostly done by a bunch of rich musicians who care more about the PR they'll get than actually helping people. And the songs themselves, when they aren't badly sung covers, are usually lifeless, condescending, and annoyingly sappy. But when it comes to hip-hop, especially in the late 80s, early 90s, it was a different story. The reason why rappers like KRS-One got a whole bunch of celebrities together was because of something that directly related to what was happening to them. After the death of a young fan at a Public Enemy slash Boogie Down Productions concert due to a couple of thieves in the crowd robbing people and turning the concert into a riot, plus KRS One losing his own producer Scott LaRock to street violence while he was trying to squash it, KRS One decided to team up with a bunch of his friends on the East Coast to not only clear hip hop's name to a mainstream media all too ready to mischaracterize the genre as the reason black violence was happening at the time, but to also speak directly to the community on a main stage about its ills in a relatable way. So they created the Stop the Violence collaboration track Self Destruction to make a statement that hip hop and modern black culture was more than the sensationalized depiction people were seeing in the media, that rap music could move butts as well as move minds. And in 1990, the following year, the West Coast made their version of that. However, it actually wasn't inspired by a cynical sense of one-upsmanship the East and West had been having since the beginning, despite how it may have come off. I mean, you look at the East Coast song and they make it clear in the titles, stop the violence because you're headed for self-destruction. Meanwhile, the West Coast version specifically wants to remind you that they're from the West Coast and are indeed all stars. They don't give a shit who you actually remember, damn it. They're all stars. But nah, it was actually masterminded by one of the founding members of the Crips named Michael Conception, who had been paralyzed from the waist down due to gang violence and was looking for a way to keep kids from going down the same path. Seeing hip-hop's growing voice as a way to spread that message, he hooked up with N.W.A.'s label Ruthless Records to make We're All In The Same Gang, conscripting the West Coast's biggest names of the time to really make it matter that they were saying this. After all, the song was made by people who made music kids and teens liked, showing that hip-hop was willing to push for positivity with the type of nuance and relatability you'd never get out of some stuffy upper-class white mothers against hip-hop or whatever bullshit that was more about demonizing a genre of music than actually improving the lives of those who listen to it. So yeah, here's their hit single, We're All In The Same Gang, flipping the framing of being in a gang as an allusion to the idea that black people collectively have had to deal with a hostile sense of otherization all throughout America's history. So with that context in mind, we should indeed be sticking together. And boy did they put their money where their mouths were, giving us verses from a wide range of hip hop artists, from the mainstream acts like Young MC or the 10 times platinum selling Hammer Man himself, to the alternative funky side of hip hop with Digital Underground, to female voices like JJ Fad and Body and Soul, to actual gangster rappers like N.W.A. All sides of hip hop were allowed in. Well, as long as they're from the West Coast. Although it did make sense though, the West Coast was just starting to spread its wings as a subgenre in 1990, and it was also the place where a lot of the stereotypes about rap being purely gangster focused was coming from. I mean, in 1990, when you think gangster rap, you think Compton, California. And they actually start off with a rapper from the city named King T, over a funky staccato beat produced by Dr. Dre. It's straight up madness everywhere I look. Used to be a straight A student, that's a crook. But it's not gonna lie, the song picks up after him, because his verse is uh, kind of generic and just a, just a little condescending. I'm trying to stress the fact that you're dumb. Get yourself presentable, son, and just come. Together, you better. I don't think it's a coincidence these lines always get cut from the short versions of the song. Of course, I, I confess, I, I don't really know that much about the guy, but from what I could find, he was one of the first rappers from Compton to make gangster rap and was apparently one of Biggie's favorite rappers. Also, he apparently made an EP in 1991 with Ice-T called Having a Tea Party. <laughs> Guess they just couldn't resist the opportunity for the pun. And hey, in addition to King T, who's from Compton, three of the members of NWA also show up. Of course, there's the fact that Dr. Dre and MC Ren's verse is curiously placed far away from Easy es verse, and the fact that Ice Cube is mysteriously absent. But to be honest, NWA was already kind of falling apart as a group before it even really began, so it was really bad at this point. Excuse me. I came up with that. Plus, there was that whole controversy a year later where Dr. Dre viciously beat up D. Barnes from another group on this song named Body and Soul, and when you look up why he did it, it was over an interview she did with Ice Cube where he was saying inflammatory shit about N.W.A., and it was actually the director F. Gary Gray's idea to edit the footage of both interviews together. And if that name rings a bell, it's the name of the director of Straight Outta Compton, who I'm sure just accidentally left out any information that would make them look bad. 
and I'm not bringing this up just to put these guys down, but because everything about NWA's situation unfortunately kind of undermines the song's message about black unity. It makes their parts come off like a bit of a pose, especially when it comes to NWA's lyrics and how kind of non-committal they are. Show easy's no sellout, and if you can't hang in the streets, then get the hell out. Like they're saying, yeah, black on black violence is bad, but you know, gang members actually listen to our music, so we, we can't denounce the gang shit too much. Like, really? Is, is this the moment to remind us how sinister you are? Take notes from Easy E, the violent hero. Yes, stop the violence, everyone. Take it from me, a violent person. But, to be fair, a lot of the other rappers typically known for their hardcore lyrics actually come through with some insightful commentary, like the group Above the Law, who calls out the fact that most violence isn't senseless, but usually has deeper implications to it. And they especially bring up how poor black people are kept in the type of situations that lead to gangs due to a neglectful government that wasn't set up to help black people in the first place. Yeah, a couple of spots are getting popped. And if the government wants the fancy dick in August, God. But they don't. Because they want it like that. Because the system is set up to hold us back. Then there's Ice T, who probably flips one of his sharpest verses. I got an idea. Give me a minute. And if it makes sense, then get with it. What if we could take our enemy, feed them poison? Undereducate the girls and boys and split them up. Make them fight one another. Better yet, make them kill for a color. And after that, there's Def Jeff, an incredibly lyrical spitter who unfortunately got relegated in hip-hop history to a guest verse on a Shaq song, but gets more time on here to shine with a poignant message complemented by a sick multisyllabic flow. Everyone came in the same chains, caught with the same aim, brain games, and names chain. Destroyed the black male crack jail and semi-automatic static if the crack fails. Oh, and then there's Tone Loke's part, whose voice is so damn smooth they had to switch up the beat just to match his coolness. Now I think you. I used to get my bang on, and on the app, get my part-time slang on. One time for me was no joke, though. I'm talking to all the blust and all the crimps. Throw down your rag and get on the right track, man. It's time to fight tonight and be a black man. And then most unexpectedly, MC Hammer actually comes through with a storytelling rap about how ego and alcohol lead to tragedy, utilizing one of the tightest flows I've ever heard him use. All the homies getting blind in an eight ball line. Now on this tip, they start running in the lip. Hit the block about 12 on the tick. The windows went down and the knives went click. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Michelle, Dr. Dre's girlfriend who handles the hook. And it always threw me off that the person singing and the person talking are actually the same person. We got to put our heads together. Make the chance, cause we're all in the same game. How does this woman sing like Aretha Franklin but talk like a toddler? It's like cartoon logic, it doesn't make any sense. But speaking of people who use different voices, of course I've got to end by mentioning Digital Underground who come through with my favorite verse of them all. I'm in a rage. Oh yeah? Yo, why is that G? Other races, they say we act like rats in a cage. I tried to argue, but check it, every night in the news, we prove them suckers right, and I got the blue. I'm he evokes the imagery of lynching and white supremacists in a darkly comedic way to push home the point about how black on black violence accomplishes a racist institution's job for them. Yo, do you work for the clan? Do what you like. Unless you like gang banging. Let's see how many brothers leave us hanging. Oof, quite the double entendre. Unfortunately, there's a lot of short versions out there that randomly cut out verses and lyrics, so if you can find the 7 minute version, definitely go for that one, because it's frustrating to hear some of the better verses getting cut off in the middle of them making a good point about something. But overall, you know, I'd give it a 5 out of 5. Yes, the NWA verses are kind of awkward, and when put in perspective of how they acted in real life, it takes some of the luster away from their contribution. But they are half kind of responsible for making the collab in the first place, and they honestly don't do enough to detract on their own from everyone else. And for a seven minute song about a serious topic everyone's technically writing the same verse about, it never feels like it gets boring, it never drags. And while I enjoy the self-destruction song more for its clearer, more coherent message, there's still a lot of enjoyment I get out of seeing the likes of Shock G, MC Hammer, and Tone Loke on the same track together. Especially at a time before now when, you know, virtually everyone's on everyone else's albums anyway. Well, that's the episode. Leave a like if you like because it helps, comment if you have something to say because it helps even more, and hit the subscribe button and the bell because it helps the most. Also, a random thing, but I just put up an acapella cover of Set Adrift on Memory Bliss of You by PM Dawn on my Patreon, where I replaced all the instruments with my voice, so if you want to check that out, that's free to listen to on there. Set Adrift on Memory Bliss of You and if you want to get my merch, follow me on social media, listen to my podcast, or support the show, you can see all those links in the link tree below. So check all that fun stuff out, and I'll catch you next time. Peace. <laughs>